Welcome to the podcast that's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist, the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee, and we have with us here Pivot Cycles and DT Swiss's Hannah Otto. Stoked to have you, Hannah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, you've got a race coming up this weekend. If people are going to be listening to this, they'll be listening to it on a Thursday if it comes out, or perhaps you're listening to it afterward in the archive. But you're going to be racing Belgian Waffle Ride, Utah. And I want to talk to you about that because I've been looking at the forecast because I think a lot of athletes are going to target this race. It's prior to the Lifetime Grand Prix, so it's kind of like a good chance to kind of get the wiggles out before you really jump into the full racing uh, against everybody but it's going to be real cold. Uh, if the forecast holds, it's changing like every hour. So we'll see. But, uh, can we talk a little bit about what you do when you see a race coming up? That's like freezing cold, possibly wet, windy, muddy, kind of like all the elements going against you. Like, how are you managing that? Because a lot of athletes see that and they're just like, Oh, I'm like, I've, I've lost already. I'm done. You know, but how do you do it? Well, first, I check the weather every hour, hoping it will change. <laughs> no, but it is it is so funny because exactly like you said, I'm using this as a training race, which is something I know we talk a lot about on this podcast is not every race is an A race. Some races you do, you know, for training, for preparation for other races. So just like you said, this is a preparation opportunity for Sea Otter for the first event in the Lifetime Grand Prix. And so I signed up for it. And then after I signed up for it, I looked at the weather and my jaw dropped. I mean, the whole <laughs> week is basically in the 60s. And then out of nowhere, right now, the weather I'm looking at, the high, the high is 39 um, with, I think, like possible scattered rain and snow. And it just depends what weather app you look at. But... <laughs> That definitely yeah, came as a surprise. <laughs> I was using the weather uh, weather app that I have, and I had no clue that it could have multiple weather icons. It usually has like a sun or a sun with clouds or cloud or rain or snow. And this one has <laughs> red wind, which means really high wind. It then, in addition to that, has snow, rain, and hail. And it's all like, and like the day is just super wide because it's like the forecaster just doesn't know what to do. It's just going to be yeah. a wild day. It says it is. Now. So, yeah, so how do you prepare I think, for that? I think a multitude of ways. So in in one sense, this is an, a chance where experience, I think, is super helpful to go back on because I've ridden in those type of conditions more times than I can count. And so even though I'm dreading it probably just as much as everybody else out there, I can sort of take a deep breath and say, okay, but I've done it before. I know I can make it through this. I know I've done this. Um, and then the mental preparation, I think for me, at least in the cold is a huge thing because the bottom line is it is uncomfortable and you'll likely be uncomfortable potentially the whole day. Um, <laughs> and that's okay though. You know, like out there a lot of the time, especially in the cold Usually what will get to me is more of the panic than the actual the actual conditions. So, oh my gosh, I'm so cold. What if I get colder? This is so miserable. It's raining. It's like the panic that you're in those circumstances, not actually that you are experiencing some sort of life or health threatening condition. And so calming down, I think, is super important. Recognizing how you feel right now and not trying to extrapolate that out like, oh, well, if I'm this cold now, I'm going to be mm. even colder in two hours because weather is also ever changing. Um, so I always like to really hang on to the hope of like, but it could get warmer in 30 minutes. It could stop raining in five <laughs> yeah. minutes, right? Like that kind of lying to yourself, bargaining with yourself, hoping. Um, those are sort of the abstract ideas, right? But I think they're really important. And then other than that, I think getting into more objective preparation is, of course, the layering, um, just the types of clothing that you have and having all of the options. I mean, I live about three hours away from Cedar City. So I'll be driving down there with just about every different type of jacket <laughs> that I have. And not only will I bring them down there, but I'll have a lot of them in the feed zones. So whatever Smart. I choose to not start with, I will give to Clayton and he'll have in the feed zone. Um, 
And if I never need it, I never need it. I don't even have to look at it. But I think sometimes even just knowing that you have those options in the feed zones can be so helpful because you do experience less of that panic of like, okay, I just have to make another five miles and then I can add a jacket if I want um, or whatever it might be. For me, my hands and my feet are always the biggest issues. So a lot of different types of gloves. Um, If it is going to be raining, I'll probably, you know, have two of the same types and even switch them so that I can have a warm one halfway through Um, and just not being afraid also to switch clothes. I know in the XCOs, for example, I'm willing to just be uncomfortable the whole time. I've raced XCOs in 30 degrees where I wore nothing but arm warmers, but this is 128 miles and that discomfort will wear on you also in the form of thermoregulation and burning more calories. Um, And so I want to be a little bit more of a princess out there taking care of my body, adjusting layers as needed. And then, as I just said, also being super aware of the caloric burn associated with that and probably eating more in a circumstance where your desire is to eat less. Oh, yeah, that's because you don't want to eat or drink as much, right? When Mm -hmm. it's cold. You just, your mm-hmm. body, like you, you don't feel it quite as much. It also strangely happens in extreme heat too, where you don't want to, yeah. certainly on the eating side, you don't want to eat as much. So it's like sticking, making that plan beforehand, I assume. And then just making sure that you're sticking to it with time rather than going by hunger. Right. Absolutely. And also the reminder that, um, especially fluids, you know, the liquid in your bottles is going to get cold when it's that cold outside. And it can it can be an uncomfortable experience to continue to drink that. But once that fluid goes in your body, it does help to actually keep you warmer. And so using, again, your brain, your plans, your intellect, rather than your feelings and sensations are going to be really important in this race. You for nutrition, at least. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. A key point that I feel like you mentioned is there's this, sometimes you get in a situation that's, um, that throws off a lot of alarm bells in our body and that might be training or otherwise, but it throws off a lot of alarm bells and we let the fear and panic of the moment overwhelm the reality of the moment. Yeah. Like the reality is like you said that, no, I'm okay. I like, I'm not dying. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, what I need, instead of thinking about what this will be like later on down the road, I just need to focus on what I need to do right now and just stay in the moment and go with that. And I think that that's, that's a really key thing for those challenging sort of days. And there are probably a lot of people listening to this that have some sort of, I mean, maybe you're doing Belgium Waffle Ride Utah, but may, you know, you have some sort of event like this, that's going to happen this spring where it's going to be pretty miserable weather or if you're you know in southern hemisphere in the fall and it's going to be pretty miserable weather either side so um it's interesting stuff i'm excited to see how you do um i hope it's a really strong field that shows up too and it kind of gives us like a bit of an indication maybe about what belgian or what sea otter and the rest of the lifetime grand prix will be like i'm excited to see that um can I ask you something, Hannah? Um, cause I've seen you over the past few months, you've been training in Palm Springs and you've been riding on your mountain bike, doing big days, but then I've seen you on your gravel bike. I've seen you on your road bike, doing a lot of stuff. And when I say seen you, it's, it's all on Hannah's Instagram. Um, so you can go follow her by the way, it's linked down below. Uh, but within that, how do you split that up? That's another question that I just, cause there are a lot of athletes that are probably getting new bikes this time. So like is there a certain type of workout or a certain type of training that you will or will not do on any one of those bikes? Yeah. I mean, I do all of my intervals on a road surface. Um, maybe if it's like a very smooth gravel road and I'm doing something that I can very consistently hold like tempo or sweet spot or something, then I would do it smooth gravel or road. Um, And then my aerobic days are where I would put things on more undulating terrain. And I'm still working really hard to stay in zone two. And I'm doing that by shifting a lot according to the terrain. Um, But that's my opportunity to work on skills and all those things. And then the intervals days are for exactly that, hitting those numbers you know, no matter what, which for me usually requires that road terrain. That said, I use different bikes on the road all the time. So I will ride my mountain bike on the road. Um, I'll ride my gravel bike on the road and I'll ride my road bike on the road. Um, 
And that's all just depending on the workout, depending on what races I have coming up. I mean, I have my fit dialed in on all of the bikes to be quote unquote, exactly the same, but there still are different nuances, like the way your hands are positioned that does feel different. And I think it's important to practice those nuances and those different feelings. And, you know, something we've mentioned here before, too, is sometimes I'm making those decisions even based on what terrain I have available. Like if I have a long interval and I know I'm going to blow through that hill on the road bike too fast, maybe I'll ride the mountain bike just because it will be a little bit slower and my interval won't end and, you know, I'll be able to finish my interval by the top of the hill. Um, so there is Smart a method move. to the madness for sure. <laughs> but it also is somewhat abstract of, you know, don't be afraid to mix and match according to what you need to achieve the goal of the day. And I think that's probably the biggest thing is one of the things I like to do is I'll read the workout that I have. And then before I do anything else, I'll sort of map out in my mind of, okay, so what is the goal of this workout? Not like to hit this number and hit this number, but like, okay, today I'm working on threshold, you know, maybe it's short rest periods. So those are really important to adhere to or, you know, whatever it might be um, so that I have that overarching sort of North star throughout the workout. So that if things do get crazy, I can still go back to achieving that main purpose of the session. Yeah. Smart move. Well, cool. Uh, that one addresses some of the questions that some of you have submitted at trainerroad.com slash podcast. So you can submit your questions there or on Spotify. You can go right there when you're listening in the Spotify app on your phone or on the computer. There's a spot where you can enter, enter in a question and you can enter in your coaching question. Put it there. We'll come through them every week and we'll answer them here on the podcast. Let's get into Riley's question. Riley says, thanks for the awesome podcast. I've been listening for over a year now and I can definitely say it's made me faster. Last year, I took up heat training after seeing what seemed like everybody I know using saunas. I looked up suggested protocols and got an infrared sauna that I used after workouts for 45 to 60 minutes at 140 degrees. I found it unbearable at first, and note that this is an infrared sauna, so 140 degrees may not quite feel like 140 degrees in a different sauna. They all feel slightly different. Um, I found it unbearable at first, but I got used to the discomfort, but the big problem I had was that not, was that not only was it not helping me in hot races, it actually seemed to be hurting. I ended up stopping in July and sure enough, I started doing better in hot weather. I feel pretty embarrassed to admit this, but I only recently listened to the science of getting faster episode with Dr. Minson. That is a great episode, by the way, I'll link it down below. Dr. Chris Minson is one of the, like, uh, He's, he's been instrumental in a lot of the research that's been published on heat training in the realm of athletics and endurance performance and, and some really cool stuff. And we interviewed him and it was really insightful. Um, it'd be cool to catch up with Dr. Minson again, uh, Dr. Minson, if you're listening to this, it'd be really cool to catch up and maybe see if you've had any novel learning since we recorded that podcast. Um, so, uh, in this case, Riley says that he just listened to that episode and he realized that and going back to quoting the question, the goal was to simply maintain elevated core temperature to cause specific adaptive signaling in your body. Knowing this, it seems like I was probably overdoing it. Would you agree? I still have the sauna as I was too lazy to sell it. And I always had this question in the back of my mind that maybe I wasn't using it properly. So how would you suggest I use the sauna to improve performance in hot races? Thanks again. Uh, Hannah, uh, do you use sauna? I mean, you're up in like Salt Lake City, Utah, so um, plenty hot during the summer and stuff, but during the winter, it is not hot. So do you use saunas in your training or any sort of heat training like this? I don't, mostly because I don't have one. And obviously, there are always ways to get around that gym membership, all of that. Um, but the protocol is actually pretty specific for saunas. So if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. And I think, you know, this is something we're going to dig into this into this for this question is exactly that. So do I have the bandwidth to do it right? Because if you don't do it the exact way it's supposed to be done, all you're doing is adding extra stress without gaining the benefits. And so for me, I've found that I can put my energy somewhere else um, rather than this and I feel at this point, get more gains. That doesn't mean that I won't have the bandwidth for this in the future and lean into this for a gain somewhere else. But yeah, the protocol does have to be pretty specific and you are walking 
a line that, you know, stress is stress is stress. So heat training in the form of passive training, sauna training is still stress on the body. And I'm guessing, or I know that's something we're about to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is, I'm looking at this in 45 to 60 minutes at 140 degrees. Now the 140 degrees, again, infrared sauna is perhaps different than if you're using something that like a like, you know, like a steam rock or dry sauna that is actually using like a heating element, like a fire or some sort of hot stones or something else. It will feel, at least in my experience, I feel like it feels less hot, like 140 degrees in infrared doesn't feel as hot as it would in others. But I also don't know if indeed it's having the same effect or anything else like that. I just don't know. With that said, this does seem like excessive. Uh, Number one, there are two big red flags to me. Number one, 45 to 60 minutes. That seems like too much to me, Hannah. But then the other thing is, and I don't know because this wasn't explicitly stated, but it's stated used after workouts. And I worry like if this is being used after every workout or to like how frequent this is, we don't have this Mm -hmm. information here from Riley, but because the frequency matters a ton. Like Mm -hmm. you don't want to be pairing this on top of things. Hannah, if you did have a sauna, let's just say that you have one, it's easy access. What protocol would you follow? Yeah. So exactly. 45 to 60 minutes is a really long time. Usually in the protocols that I've read, it's about 30 minutes. Um, And I've read 30 minutes not with it not being above 165 degrees. So I'm assuming that that would mean you know, as close to that as tolerable, and you probably have to build up to it. And again, I don't know the intricacies of type of sauna, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, But I have seen that, like Riley mentioned, the goal is the core temperature. So your goal is to achieve a core temperature. Again, I've read somewhere between 100 and 101 um, core temperature from this. And you... You want to use this in the lead up to an event. You need at least five to seven consecutive days for the protocol to work. But then you need a recovery period. You need realistically about seven days of recovery before your event in order for your body to to actually achieve those gains, just like training stress, right? Is like we train really hard and then we recover for our body to achieve those gains. And so you would want to start a sauna protocol about 14 days out from your event, do seven days doing the sauna after your workout so that your core temperature is already elevated. You get in for the 30 minutes, elevated even higher, um, and then you stop seven days before the event so that you can recover. And that's because of exactly what we just talked about is it is an extra stress on the body. Um, You're not supposed to rehydrate while you're in the sauna, which means you're becoming more and more dehydrated. You are supposed to rehydrate outside of the sauna. So over the course of the next two to three hours outside the sauna, you are supposed to fully rehydrate, which again is another place where it's really important to get that right. Because if not, you're just becoming more and more dehydrated. Um, And because of all of these factors, it, it is stress on the body and your training has to accommodate that. And so when you're doing sauna sessions, Usually it is uh, suggested that you decrease both your volume and intensity of training during that time as well. So just like you're saying in the question, it seems like it's actually hurt my training. It very likely did during the time in which you are doing the sauna, but that's not the time you're looking for gains, just like you wouldn't go into a race and be like, I did a VO2 workout yesterday. Why didn't that help me today? you would never do that. So it's the same principle with the sauna. Um, And I think thinking of it in that way might help you adjust your expectations. Yeah, well said, Hannah. This is the interesting point where you, all of you listening to this, probably decouple from the average listener that's listening to more generalized advice that's talking about using a sauna protocol in your daily life. Now, there are a lot of people that don't have workouts on a training plan that are stressing them every day. So we see things like, you know, a daily, whether it's cold plunge, whether it's sauna or any of these other things that are like stimulus introductions where you can basically like bring in some form of stimulus and do it regularly. So we hear about like things like zone two training, and then we hear about things like high high intensity interval training as these novel concepts for people to basically 
do what you're already doing. In other words, make it a habit in your life to have periods of stress that are intentional, that are measured, that you put yourself through. And if you do that consistently, it creates a whole lot of, you know, basically adaptations, but then it creates favorable outcomes in your health and fitness. An average person is is seeking for these different routines that they can put into their life all the time. Meanwhile, you're already doing this with training. So you always have to keep a big grain of salt handy whenever you're hearing more generalized advice. And an athlete has to use these things very different. And I know that you're probably thinking, well, I'm not an athlete. I'm an accountant or I'm a, I'm a, I'm a mom or I'm a whatever it might be. But you're also an athlete. So like if you're if you're the sort of person that trains and rides regularly, you're an athlete. So with that in mind, I think I want to talk specifically about like how to use this in terms of coupling it with the workouts. And then I also want to talk about opportunity costs after this. But this is not the sort of thing that if you're if you're looking at um your week of training, and let's just say that you have two days of intensity a week. And then aside from that, you have two to three days of lower intensity work. In my opinion, if you have on the next day coming up a high intensity workout, that's probably not the time. The day before is not the time to do that sauna, a protocol. Like Hannah said, it's just stress on the body that's already stressed. And you're coming into something that's important that you hit your marks. Therefore, I likely would not do it the day before you have something hard. If anything, probably your intense days, hopefully, are spread out from each other. So you're not doing them back to back. So maybe it's either after that uh, intense day, you know, after that intense workout, you might do it then. Or if you have an extra day in between now and your next workout, you could do it after your easy workout, just as long as it's padded out by a day. Um, That's what I would at least recommend. And I would not recommend doing this as a normal thing you do all the time, but rather periodizing it like Hannah is saying. This is something that, because there's there's two main benefits of heat training, right? Like number one, increase blood, blood plasma volume, which can thusly also increase the blood or the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. So it's effectively like a quote legal blood doping that you could say there in the sense that what you can do is you can improve the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood, which could then, unless you hit other bottlenecks, of course, down the road, increase your body's ability to operate with oxygen and and be able to create energy or, you know, take energy and put it into work. Which is why saunas are also used for altitude acclimation. Exactly right, because that's what happens at altitude as well, right? In the sense that we increase our red blood cell count in this response to the fact that we have less readily available oxygen. So our body's like, well, I'll just introduce more carriers for it, and then that'll help. So there's that side of it. But then there's there's the two other sides. There's sweat rate, right? And basically getting your body to be able to sweat more readily to try to help cool itself. A lot of people perhaps don't sweat a lot, or their sweat response is something that's like blunted, if you will, because of being in a cold environment. And if you go into a hot environment, your body might not be as efficient at thermoregulation. So if you do this, it can get your body used to that process of thermoregulation through sweat. The other side of it too, though, is also just psychological adaptation to really hot circumstances. Mm -hmm. So when you think of all of those benefits, that isn't something that you just, and I know in your mind, it's like, why can't I just stay elevated with this stuff all the time? But that's just like training. Like, why can't you be in peak fitness all the time? Because it's inherently a peak. And if you try to stay there, you won't be able to stay as high. Your fitness will drop down. So there's an opportunity cost to all of this. I would not suggest doing this in just like a consistent thing that you're doing, but rather just like Hannah said, two weeks out from the event, do it for a week. But that week has to be taken into consideration. Like Hannah said, you drop the intensity and you drop the volume, like uh, the duration of your training. So you have to ask yourself, if that week is going to be a key week for training, is it really worth the sauna that's going to compromise that training? And that's something that you have to weigh. Um, If you feel like you've really kind of already dotted the I's and crossed the T's and your fitness is really good and it's where you want it to be, then yeah, this might be something you want to do. But if you feel like you're on a really good trajectory and you need that final week to really reach those new limits, and then you'll have that week of recovery before your race week, then I probably wouldn't look at bringing this in um, just because it's going to take away from your ability to train and perform, push your limits, and then super compensate from that. So, and I've, I've used sauna training. We have a sauna here at the office, which is really cool. And I mean, I've used it. I find it, I've found it best to do it right after the workout. You want to get the sauna hot before you start. So before my workout, I'll train like indoors here. And then what I'll do is I'll go in before the workout and I'll turn the sauna on. So then I get right in there. 
because the whole point, like Hannah said, is elevating core temp to like 37 to 38 C or 100 to 101. And you want to elevate your core temp with your training and then keep it elevated afterward, but just not have as much fatigue coming from the fact that you're sitting down instead of training on the bike. Um, so that's like a good way, the ideal way, I would say, to be able to implement this. But it's kind of interesting, though, Hannah, because this is really in vogue for the past like five years. And now I've seen a slightly like a different approach. I think a lot of athletes, even professionals at the top level, were overdoing it. Mm -hmm. And they were cooking themselves and just introducing too much fatigue. I've seen a lot of athletes now just doing and like pro athletes riding indoors and they're using like a sweatsuit. So like, uh, they're like, they basically look like a giant zip up poncho that covers your whole body. And they're wearing that. I mean, you could also just like put on all of your winter riding clothes and they're just doing like an easy roller session for like, you know, 20 minutes, something somewhere around there. And they're riding that, but they're doing it in like a room with a heater and it's really hot and they're just sweating like crazy in that room. Mm -hmm. So there's probably more ways if you don't have a sauna that you can get this done. I don't know if you've heard of any other effective ways of doing it. I mean, I guess training outside in the heat is one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there like there's so many different ways when it comes to heat acclimation and achieving these goals. I mean, and it just I think that um I think that sometimes really extreme routes are what seems the coolest, right? And so <laughs> we really gravitate and not to say that saunas are extreme, but it requires an investment and it's it's photograph you know you can yeah. photograph it and things like that right same with the suit so these are the things that we gravitate towards of seeing people do oh my gosh that means i have to do that um but it can be as simple as maybe you live in a hot place and instead of riding at 7 a.m you go out at noon in the heat of the day um maybe you wear a jacket when it's already warm outside Maybe you don't need to wear a sweatsuit. Maybe you just turn your fan off for 30 minutes at the end of your workout and do your aerobic uh, ride or your cool down without a fan. Like maybe you ride if you want to be a little more extreme. Maybe you ride in the laundry room or in the bathroom with the shower on. Like there's all kinds of ways to accomplish this. Some seem more exciting than <laughs> others. But, you know, I think there's a, a many ways to skin a cat and... It's also interesting because just like everything else we talk about, everyone's going to handle these things differently. But again, because some because a sauna is such an like a concrete thing, we create a protocol around it and then we have to in many ways because it can be dangerous if done incorrectly or at least hinder your training if done correctly. We hold really tightly to this protocol. But not everyone responds to heat the same way. I mean, we see that for sure in hot races throughout the summer. And so some people, it might impact their training greater. Some people might not adapt as well. Some people, it's going to take longer than others. So my advice would be if you're going to do this to not, like we said, periodize it, but don't do your first periodization the week before your biggest race. Like, don't be like, okay, I'm racing Leadville. I'm going to get a gym membership with a sauna for the month before and do this for Leadville. Practice it at least a couple of times so that you know how your particular physiology responds to this because it will be different than your friend and whomever else. Really well said. There's three other details I want to cover because I just, I'm thinking about like, what questions will people ask? Like, yeah. number one, core temperature measurement. Really, there is only mm -hmm. one way to measure core temperature, and that's with like a rectal thermometer. Uh, yep. The core body temp sensors that you see a lot of athletes using. This is just coming. I, I have not personally used one. I want to make sure I make that clear. Um, but this is just coming from athletes um, and other coaches and everything else that I've spoken to that use them um, and researchers in labs that have used them and tested them against a lot of equipment. That's the most important reference. And while they capture delta, while they sometimes capture deltas, they do not capture accurate measurements um, mm -hmm. in terms of getting exactly what your core temp is. So, effectively, if you're looking for like, well, how do I know if it's elevated enough? If you feel really hot, like really uncomfortably hot, there you go, you're set, um, you're done. Um, another great way to do this also is just a hot bath where you keep yes. spots that would vent easily, like your hands, your feet, armpits, chest, that sort of thing. 
just like go in the water up into up to your like up to your neck right and then if you do that you'll find yourself like you'll even get out of the bath and you'll still be sweating uh probably defeats the purpose of a bath um but at the same time that's another like more accessible way to do this um so those are those are the thoughts there but i think and and also maybe the last thing is if you're riding and training in hot conditions, whether that's inside and you don't have great ventilation, which most people don't have good enough ventilation when they're riding inside, or if you're training outside and it's hot and it's like summertime, you're probably, quote, adapted to the heat already. You probably have favorable things like this thermoregulatory response with sweat, uh, increased blood plasma volume. You probably already have those to a certain degree. So going and adding in more likely isn't going to be effective, but the probability of it acting as an additional source of stress that could compromise your training is just going to increase if you do that. So keep all those things in mind. I think that it just has to be used strategically. And like Hannah said, it can be overdone, uh, especially because it appeals or appears cool. So, Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. Carl has a question. This one's really interesting. And I wonder, Carl, if you follow Dr. Kelly Sturette, amazing uh person and he's been on our podcast before he's just awesome um because he recently posted a video about this and i thought it was really interesting and there's some other research that i really want to dig into more on this and i'm thinking of even doing a video because there's a lot of really interesting research that's older and some newer stuff that it's really cool but just the same carl says hi hosts i'm immersed in the world of apnea diving and have found myself questioning whether it is benefiting my body's co2 tolerance while cycling It seems this would be beneficial in allowing me to go harder for longer periods of time. Is there any research on training CO2 tolerance causing improvements in cycling performance? Uh, So to answer the question, first of all, apnea diving, that's breath hold diving effectively. So diving without apparatus like an oxygen tank or anything else, you dive without that. It's pretty crazy. And if you don't know about it, you should really look into it because it's, it's pretty scary, but also really like, wow, what these people can do. Um, there's really unique things that happens like with your body's responses and how it senses it's submersion in water. And then also with the pressure balances of being underwater that actually allows you to hold your breath for a shocking amount of time. Um, but anyways, with that being said, there's this whole concept of like CO2 tolerance within this. And before I even begin on this, I just want to ask Hannah, have you once again, we're kind of talking about sauna training is like another thing that you can add. Have you ever thought about adding in like breath holding work to your training? Cause it's increasing in popularity. It seems. It is increasing in popularity and I've done a lot of reading on this, but no, it has not been something that I've added to my training yet. So I'll be really curious to hear your thoughts here. It looks like you have a lot, uh, to share. Yeah. I'll try to like keep it succinct and easy. And, and to be clear, there's a lot of research that I have not yet reviewed on this. I've reviewed some meta-analyses and about seven individual studies that have looked into this. Um, but aside from that, there's a lot of stuff that I still need to research to really get a grasp on this topic, but let's just explain the concept. So like the concept is that doing this apnea diving or learning to hold your breath, that that could then help you on the bike in, in Carl's words, going harder for longer periods of time. So let's explain the concept here. Um, CO2, it's a byproduct of aerobic and anaerobic metabolism, and it increases with intensity. So as you're training and you are taking energy stored in your body, and then it's your cells are turning this into work. Um, and then you're moving your bike down the road, right? As it increases in intensity, what you're doing, you will be creating more byproduct or more exhaust, just like a car. The throttle goes down more, more exhaust comes out, right? And one of the components of that exhaust is CO2. Now, CO2, the bad parts about it is it combines with water within your body to form carbonic acid that dissociates or is broken down into height into hydrogen ions. And just like with when we're talking about anaerobic metabolism and we're talking about breaking down sugar and lactate, and then when lactate's broken back down, you get more hydrogen in your blood that creates an acidic environment. Well, CO2 is also contributing to this. It's not just lactate, right? So then if your blood's more acidic, it impairs all that enzymatic activity that could be happening in your body that is basically breaking things down. Boom, you got energy. So it just impairs that from happening. It also impairs the body's ability to carry oxygen. It sounds like this is, and I need to do more research on this, but it sounds like this is pretty individually variable. And interestingly enough, also gender, like very much influenced by gender, uh, I don't know for sure. I don't want to speak further on that because I need to in, like research it more, but it seems as if that's the case because there are consistencies in some of the studies that I was seeing. 
Now, CO2 accumulation is also sensed by the chemoreceptors in your body, so located in the brain, actually the brain stem, and basically that's going to cause you to increase your respiration rate, um, and it'll cause like involuntary respiration, like hyperventilation, and even like the sense of panic that comes from when you feel like you can't breathe, that's all, that's all induced by those chemoreceptors that you have in your body. So CO2, when it's sensed by those, all those things start to happen. So your body stops working as effectively in terms of muscularly and then also just psychologically. You get these alarm bells going off. So that's what CO2 does. And as you work harder, you accumulate more of it. So we can see why it would be detrimental to performance. And then the concept is that you could train it. And if you trained it, uh, some favorable things could happen. You could decrease the production of CO2. Uh, and basically through like greater efficiency, like aerobic efficiency, and you could increase your body's ability to buffer that CO2. So essentially like as you get more aerobically efficient, you're going to lean less on the anaerobic side of things. As a result, you'll produce less CO2. But even then, if you train this, you should be able to not only produce less, but also what is produced, you should be able to get rid of it faster. And the way you get rid of it is it goes into your bloodstream, goes to the lungs, and then you exhale it, right? Because we exhale CO2, and that's how our body gets rid of it. And then on the tolerance side of things, we should be able to like modify the way our chemoreceptors work, like their sensitivity, which is really kind of an interesting concept. But if you think about this, it's really similar to like light exposure or anything else that we have. Uh, if you just open your eyes or you turn on the light in a dark room to a light room, if it's something that's like a big contrast and something that you're not used to, it's going to seem extremely bright and it's going to take you a while to adapt. If you're used to those light value changes very frequently, it's less jarring to your body. And this is another spot where you could modify your body's response to that. So perhaps less effect on your breathing, less effect also on um, panic or anything else that you may feel. Um, so here's how you'd train it. This is all the theory, right? Like raise your FTP. Uh, if you raise your FTP, that's through aerobic or anaerobic training. And what that does is that raises your threshold, that decreases your dependency again on anaerobic metabolism, makes whatever you're doing more sustainable, whether that's 100, 200, 300, whatever the power is, it just makes it more sustainable if your threshold's going up, right? Um, the other thing that you can do is increase your repeatability. And basically that's through anaerobic work. That's going to focus on those really hard efforts that you're doing. And then it's going to strategically give you limited rest between intervals. And the whole thought behind this is that it like systematically trains CO2 management limits. Like you bump up against them and then you ease off. Then you bump up against it again and you ease off. And hopefully what you're doing is like, Hey body, get the picture here. Like increase your ability to be able to manage all of these limits that you have with CO2. It's going to happen often. I'm sure showing you that it's happening often. So let's change and let's make it so it's not as much of a limiter for us. And then your body should respond with super compensation to that. Now, breath work is another way that you could do this and you could increase the efficiency of like your diaphragmatic and intercostal muscles. So the muscles that are used to move your lungs. Um, and if you're, and I'll get into this in just a little bit, but you're probably already doing a lot of that. And then again, you could probably also modify those chemoreceptors with some breath work too. So in other words, raising your FTP, increasing your repeatability, and also working with specific breath work, all those things could, in theory, increase your body's ability to manage CO2. Um, but what does research say? Uh, there's a systematic review and meta-analysis from 2022 from Asis Fernandez and colleagues, and it says, effects of apnea training on aerobic and anaerobic performance, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So seven out of 545 studies met the inclusion criteria for this systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, here are the criteria, just so you know. It must be a peer-reviewed publication, a clinical trial, involve healthy humans, investigate the effects of apnea training, and the variables included must be markers of aerobic and anaerobic, perform anaerobic performance, such as like VO2 max, lactate, that sort of thing. And here were the results from looking at this, which they had after they narrowed it down to five studies, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, um, or forgive me, not five, but seven studies, they had 126 participants. So that would be a massive study if you really you know, had this, of course. So with 126 uh, participants, the results were, they stated, apnea training may increase peak blood lactate concentration and possibly lactate tolerance. This could be helpful in sports requiring high anaerobic capacity. And then it also, what they stated, it doesn't seem to increase peak VO2 or other aerobic markers. 
So Hannah, it seems like this sort of like holding your breath effectively, getting your body used to CO2 tolerance, but then also training your body and getting it used to CO2 tolerance, whether that's through aerobic and anaerobic training and breath work. All that seems like from this systematic review meta-analysis, it can improve, like you can actually, you can produce more lactate and perhaps tolerate that better is an assumption, but not non-tested assumption, but it isn't going to help you aerobically. Is that like, uh, does that, so I, does that change any way of your thinking or how would you plan on implementing this or why would you not? Yeah. I mean, I think again, it, it's gonna depend on what discipline, like it's going to help some disciplines in cycling more than others, obviously, because some disciplines are more anaerobic focused and some are more aerobic focused. Um, that said, cycling inherently really likes to cross over zones unless you're in TT. There's probably always going to be a time in uh, the race in which you go anaerobic. So I don't see a lot of negatives to including this. It certainly isn't going to hurt it would seem. Um, I'm I'm curious, my my first thought when I hear about this and even listening to you talk about it, like you said, decreasing that panic. To me, I think that seems like one of the biggest factors. And that would be really difficult to measure. But if you ever watch some of these apnea divers, that's what strikes me the most about watching them is they're about to do something that, in my opinion, is extremely scary, uh, diving down really deep without oxygen. And they are so incredibly calm. And you have to be because in order to hold your breath and tolerate this, you have to keep your heart rate low. You have to be calm. Um and the ability to, to control your nervous system in that way, I think, is something really beneficial and really remarkable. And I imagine that doing this breath work uh, outside of sport, so if you spend time doing breath work, let's say, in the morning or the evening, um, you're going to gain some of that ability to control your nervous system. And I think that would also be beneficial. Yeah. And that's, I think that the key thing to remember is a lot of athletes that might be listening to this, you might not actually see the benefit from this because of either the format that you race or how you race. You know, you may not be throwing down huge surges repeatedly all the time, or you may not be dealing with those super high intensity efforts all the time. So it is, is key to bring it in. And again, as the, the sauna stuff, this is another form of stress to your body. So like, this is not you just sitting down in the rest and digest mode. Instead, this is you taking that time that would be spent that way and using it somewhere else. The The interesting thing with this is that then there's a study that I want to look into more for more suggestions on this, but there's so, seems to be a, like a common suggestion that you can use some of this in a warm-up protocol and then see perf mm. increases in performance. But there's this big thing that we should all step back at and think about. And when you're training and training hard, like you are putting yourself into a situation where you're accumulating a lot of CO2 and you're driving up these limits. So I know like a lot of you, if you're listening to this, like, yeah, I'm always trying to raise my FTP coach, Jonathan. So why are you telling me to raise my FTP more? I'm already training. I'm already doing these things. So am I already doing this? And the answer probably is yes, to a certain degree. And that's like the interesting thing about, um, breath work. Once again, we're talking about average people versus athletes and in a vast, and Please show me studies that show otherwise down in the comments below. But I have yet to see, see a systematic review of meta-analysis that looks at trained individuals and athletes and showing that breath work, and these are these are endurance trained athletes and, and individuals, but seeing that where breath work actually makes a measurable difference. And it's likely because they are already their intercostal muscles, their diaphragmatic muscles, and the function of those muscles is already likely highly trained and efficient, whereas an average person probably isn't going to experience that. So like, that's why I think breath work in and of itself, while it could be a limiter for some for any number of different reasons, it likely isn't for the majority of athletes because you're already kind of doing this. But interestingly, Hannah, they say that swimming is one of the best ways to do this. And I can totally attest to this because I panic anytime I get in the water, right? And with my experience with prepping for Ironman Oceanside, which if anybody's listening to this right now, good luck this weekend, uh, which is exciting. That's the first kickoff kind of for the official kickoff for the Ironman season in the Northern Hemisphere. 
But that, I mean, this whole, the whole process of swimming and it's something that I haven't done in a while. And I find that when I get back into water, oh, I feel like I'm back to square one and I need to work on it. So like, I do think that there's benefits to this, but I can't say that when I'm swimming, I have this crazy anaerobic ability. I also know that I'm a really high producer of lactate though, too. So maybe I'm already like that benefit of producing more lactate or something, which it's only beneficial if you can shuttle it and get it out of there. Right. But I'm curious to, to look into this more and kind of get a better understanding of what's actually happening and, and what's been tested on this. Cause to me, it makes a lot of logical sense, but I've kind of like come over the years to like, to know that I shouldn't just trust things on logic. Like I need to, something needs to be measurable there. It's interesting that you bring up swimming. Cause that is the one place that I've probably got the closest to doing specific stuff like this. Um, for example, before race, if for whatever reason I wasn't able to get in the water ahead of time, I would do some form of box breathing. So like in for five seconds, hold for five seconds, out for five seconds, hold for five seconds um, as sort of like, you know, that warm up. Or if I was in the water, I would do some breath holding and that's quote unquote sort of thing where I'm breathing like three, five, seven, nine um, as I'm swimming to again, it. I think the sensation just of you know, in my mind, at least as I did it, I was imagining my lungs sort of stretching and like, qu again, quote unquote, warming up for these efforts. Yeah. And still, I don't know if that's true, but it's it's an interesting thing for you to have brought up the swimming, because I do think that if nothing else, again, maybe all I was doing was warming up that part of my brain that was saying, hey, don't panic. Um, and that in and of itself would help me for those crazy triathlon starts where, Sometimes you don't get the breath you wanted because you're getting splashed with water in your face or a hand in your face. <laughs> yeah. This uh maybe this is like the hook for the whole episode here is like pro cyclist, like if you want to be a pro cyclist, you need to be a swimmer or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but that's like uh maybe it's a good reason to get into the pool and to try it. There's a lot of dry land stuff that you can do. Like Hannah's mentioned the box breathing. That's absolutely a way of uh doing this. There's also like basic breath holding, where I mean very basic, where you just try to hold your breath for as long as you can. And then what you do is you take a break and then you do double rest. So like, let's say that you held your breath for a period of 20 seconds, you would then rest for 40 seconds. And then you would do the 20 seconds again. And then you'd try to do that 10 times and then boom, that's like a session done. There's also a really common one in terms of being active while you do it. If you're out walking the dog or you're walking anywhere, count your steps while you hold your breath. And then you let it go and you want the breath to be held to the point where it's uncomfortable, but you don't want it to be held to the point where it's dangerous. And that's like a huge, huge asterisk with all of this is breath training can absolutely put you in dangerous situations, particularly if you're doing it in water. So you have to like go about this and find specific protocols recommended from a professional, not from us here. Um, to go about doing this, but this is going to be like an interesting one to research more on and, and look at these different things, especially as it relates to a warm up and to see if there's any solid research behind this that shows that maybe when you're like one of the ways that we can get more from our warm up is by altering our breathing patterns during the warm up. It'll be really interesting. I'll, um, I'll be looking into it. So it's yeah, cool. or maybe, maybe a way you can warm up your body with less, um, caloric mm -hmm. uh, expenditure, you know, especially with some of these really long events that start early in the morning thinking like unbound. I'm not particularly keen on going and doing my standard 20 to 30 minute warm up before a yeah. 10 hour day. It just for me, it doesn't it, it's always sort of a give and take thing. Right. So maybe if there was a way we could start replacing that um, while burning less calories, riding less in the dark, who knows, you know? So, I, you know, it, it's an interesting, let's put a bookmark here and see what happens. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well said. Uh, Melanie's question. And if you're enjoying this podcast, let us know down below. Give the video a thumbs up. Ask us questions. If you've done this sort of thing, let us know. Um, it's cool to collect anecdote to be able to uh, have something to draw up against all the research and stuff. So let us know down below if you've done this, if you haven't done it. Or why, as a cyclist, you would never once get in a pool and swim and, you know, splash around like me and try not to drown. So swimming, man, it's crazy. Like, they expect you to, like, count your laps and keep track of counting, 
while you're trying not to die, try not to drink the pool, trying to swim with perfect form, do all that stuff. And yeah, I can't do that. So I got those form swim goggles. I was like, I'm too not smart to be able to count laps <laughs> while I do all this. So just hire someone as a lap counter every time you want to go. Swim. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good job right there. Yeah. Um, Melanie says, Hey coaches, this is my first time writing into the podcast after years of listening. I feel kind of bad for never reaching out before, but I've got an issue that I'm hoping you can help me with. Every year during the first races of the season, which are always a mix of short road races and mountain bike races, I find myself completely unprepared for the pain and discomfort of racing. It gets so bad, I find myself thinking more about quitting to end the pain rather than suffering through it. I'm sure listeners are yelling at the podcast saying, quote, do more intensity. So I want to address that. First, I want to be clear in stating I don't use trainer road. And then in parentheses, it says yet (laughs) I used the same coach for seven years until two years ago when I said, when I decided to try self-coaching that coach always had me doing only low aerobic base training until April every year. And while I do think there were benefits to that feeling like racing was far too intense for the first three months of the year is one of the reasons I started self-coaching. Since I started self-coaching, I added in one to two hard rides per week where I wouldn't look at heart rate and instead I would just ride as hard as I could on a hilly route for about 40k. This did help me feel faster for early races, but the pain and discomfort was still there. Am I missing something for race prep? Is it all in my head? Those are two like really interesting questions because the psychological side of things. What do you think about this, Hannah? There's a lot to address here. Um, I think, I think the first, the very first thing that comes to mind for me is, okay, we need to do some VO2 intervals because that is, I think that is typically the most painful thing, um, in our sport is those VO2 intervals. Which ones are hardest for you, Hannah? Is it one minute or is repeated or is it the three to five minute traditional longer ones? Three minutes. I don't like three minutes. Those guys hurt so bad. (laughs) So hard. You get to like one minute in and you're like, it starts to hit you pretty hard. And then at one and a half minutes, you're like, I can't keep going. And then you're like, oh, I'm just halfway. I just don't, I just don't understand how I can do a seven hour ride and come home and be like, where did the time go? It just flew by. What a wonderful day. And then in a three minute (laughs) VO2 interval, I'm like, it has been three seconds since I looked at the clock. Yeah. Like, what is happening? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you already went through like an emotional journey, like, you know, exactly. 360 degrees all the way back around in three seconds, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so yeah, like these intervals hurt so bad. And it sounds like you weren't doing them with your previous coach. And then it also still kind of sounds like you're not truly doing them because you're doing one to two hard rides on a 40K route, which maybe you're going hard and then backing off and going hard and then backing off, which would be a form of VO2. But if you're truly pacing this 40K route, yeah, that's a hard workout for sure. But 40K is still long enough. It's taking long enough that it's an aerobic effort at the end of the day. Um, And so you're still not tapping into those energy zones that most people consider the most painful. And then it's kind of slapping you in the face at those first races of the season. And I know that it not only is it important for those first races of the year, but also I find personally in my training, I need a few workouts to not be slapped in the face. Like those first couple of VO2 workouts of the year are always like, this gross wake up call of, (laughs) oh my gosh, what is happening? And then after maybe three, four workouts, all of a sudden something, a a switch sort of flips, not where it's like, oh my gosh, I got faster in three or four workouts, but it's like your whole body, it's almost this feeling of acceptance where it's like, okay, fine. Clearly we are going to keep doing this. So I will comply like that. That's how it at least feels to me. And so I think you really need to include some of those VO2 intervals in your training. Um, And I have some other thoughts too, but I'll let Jonathan jump in and see what he has to say about that. Yeah. Spot on Hannah. And and I think that um, you mentioned the fact that if you're going out and doing this 40 K ride, If you are going to be doing this with VO2, you should feel that you need absolute recovery in that that ride. And it should be like nothing longer than five minutes 
would be a single effort within that ride. So like whether it's a climb or rolling hills or something else, you should be riding so that by the time you get to three minutes, you don't feel like you have anything left and you need absolute rest. You don't like need like a cruise down a descent and you're good, but you need absolute rest where like you are just, you're not pedaling and you're, or you're just soft pedaling in the lowest gear you can. And that's what you can maintain. And then you should rest for somewhere equal to the amount that you did or close to, you know, you don't need to go too much higher with VO2, but somewhere around equal to slightly more than equal the amount of work that you just did. And like, that's the sort of, and you shouldn't feel eager. Like I can't wait to start my next three to five minute Mm -hmm. one. You should feel like, oh gosh, here it is again. (laughs) And if you're doing that, that's how to make, take that route. Like Hannah said, and transferring it from like this tempo to sweet spot to maybe threshold sort of effort that you're doing and making it on the north side of your threshold of your anaerobic threshold right to the point where you are doing the sort of work that's stressing that zone so i think that that's kind of like a good way for people to to maybe get their head around what it feels like uh, to be able to do this and this is honestly um i'm going to plug trainer road here but this is why like if you look at like our general base plan and everything else this is why we start to integrate vo2 not too long after you start um we do it gently and we do it with like short on offs because that's much more friendly than slapping you with three to five minute efforts and then it also like keeps track of your abilities in vo2 max and then it slowly is going to ramp those up. And when you answer in that survey and it's the first few VO2 workouts of the of the year and you're like, that was all out because I was dying and I don't think I could have done anything else. You know, I just struggled through it or I didn't make it through. When you answer that, that's when it's going to make those adjustments to make sure that you aren't doing things that are just like too hard, but instead we're building up your abilities gradually. Because like Hannah said, it will improve, but you have to make sure you're being very specific about training it, you know? And the thing is, even those that train with this, Hannah, let's say that you're really used to VO2, like you've been doing VO2, but you still show up at the race and it's really hard. I think that if you're, it's really easy to like do VO2, but not have your training progression actually ramping you up and pushing your limits with it because it always feels hard. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to know where the limit actually is because you always feel like you're at the limit. That's just the nature of the work, right? So I could see a lot of athletes still showing up at a race and having not had something that's really progressing them along and taking care of that progression and finding their limits, you still get slapped in the face when you do those VO2 efforts. Yeah, I think this is a a difficult one where someone could really take what I'm about to say a little out of context, but I think that VO2 intervals, they are supposed to be all out. In many ways, they are supposed to be to failure. Um, there is a range, you know, like I, when you get the workout, there's going to be a range that you're supposed to hit. And that is absolutely the correct range. But if you're not like really, really suffering to hit that range, you should be upping the range. Mm-hmm. Like it it should be. And this is something that people will tell me all the time. Oh, my gosh, I did the workout, but it was so hard. I felt like I was going to die. I collapsed on the ground after like that was too much. No, it was the <laughs> right amount. Yeah. It was the perfect amount. And that's right. also why we don't do these all the time. It's not like we do four or five VO2 workouts in a week. Absolutely not. That is way too much. And eventually you won't hit that range and you will suffer the other consequences of that. There needs to be more recovery between these type of workouts because you do have to go so deep. But that's the point is it is this is a workout you have to mentally prepare for and push for. And I think that also goes into the is it all in my head question, um, which is. Yeah, I know you have something to say, so I'll pause there. <laughs> yeah, because this uh, you bring up a really good point. You have to be relatively fresh enough to be able to reach those limits to see yes. improvements. Because if you're not fresh enough, you'll come into these workouts, You'll it'll still feel extremely hard, it'll feel like you're all out, but you're actually not pushing the limits. It's like a handicap system in golf almost, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you're operating handicap adjusted, and that handicap is introduced by the fatigue that you have. So- This is a really good point because I see a lot of athletes um, that will mention the fact that they've plateaued or something else. And then if you talk to them about what they're doing in their training, they're like, you know, they have 
whether it's online racing, whether it's a ton of group rides, whether it's a ton of stuff that's unstructured, they're dosing themselves with enough like relative high intensity work, but not hard enough and then easy enough in between that they're just dosing themselves with fatigue while not really getting the sort of benefits that they need from that sort of work. So then when they show up to the workout where it is intended to push their limits, they're not able to do it. So that's like a really key thing. Like you, you do need to create space in your training for these sort of workouts to, to show up to them ready versus showing up to them blunted. Uh, if yeah. you do that, you're just going to get less from them. You know, it's just going to be hard work for the sake of hard work instead of for the sake of improvement. So that's a really good yeah. point that you brought up, Hannah. Sorry. Well, and I think too, the, is it all in my head, Jonathan, you mentioned that even if you're doing these VO2 workouts, you can still show up to a race and feel slapped in the face. And I think part of that is because when we do these VO2 intervals, we even though we're suffering so bad, we still know when it's going to end. We're still counting down 20 seconds, 10 seconds, right? Mm-hmm. Like we, we know. But in a race, we don't know when the suffering is going to end because you're attacking or you're chasing someone attacking and you're just in your head begging for them to slow yes. down, like let up on the pace. Um, and you don't know when that's coming. And that takes a certain amount of, of mental fortitude as well in order to be able to push through pain that you don't know when it'll be over. And I think that takes practice. Um, mm-hmm. That That is a place where if you know of a really hard group ride, we can create space in our training for that group ride to maybe take the place of one of these really hard workouts. Um, or that's also why, like we talked about at the start of this episode, that's why people or pros will do practice races um, because it is different. And so I think that like you're saying, you know, the fact that you say the first three months of every year uh, is is too intense for you. That tells me, OK, first step is to include these intervals, period. And I think once you include those intervals, the next step would be now let's include one to two races before your most important race to practice these mental skills. And then I bet you by that second or third race, you're on and you're ready to go. Yeah. Well said. Uh, Melanie, just sign up for trainer road. Uh, done. Boom. Uh, <laughs> it takes care of this. I, I do want to say one thing that's kind of fun and, and a different way to do it. So let's say that you, for some reason, uh, you haven't signed up for trainer road yet. You totally should. If you're listening to this, by the way, go do it. If you don't like it, go check out red light, green light and see if it worked on your training. You would have been like, Oh my gosh, I did get sick there. Or man, I did underperform at that race and see if it was red. And then if you don't agree with it, we'll give you your money back. Uh, I promise uh, let us know. So go to trainroad.com and sign up for it. If you, for some reason, have not yet signed up for train road, some fun ways to train at somebody else's behest instead of the interval clock. Um, I've heard of a lot of people doing something where like they're training. They're like, I'm not going to ease off on this interval until a truck passes or a red car or, you know, an SUV of this type or something else. They come up with something fun where it's like out of their control. And it's just like, I'm going as hard as I can until this passes. And, if that car doesn't pass, then, you know, I, I will at least have really pushed my limits and gone all the way until I can't for people also putting on just like a random mix of like music. So like go to like Spotify and open up like whatever station you want to listen to. They have their, like the playlist. And if there's songs that you're unfamiliar with, like you won't know when that one ends. And most songs tend to be somewhere around three to five minutes. So it's like really good VO2 max duration. And then you can work and you could just be like, all right, so this interval is this song. I have no clue if it's like three minutes long or if it's five minutes or if it's two minutes, we'll find out. Um, That can be a fun way to be able to do it. Uh, Forgive me for bumping the mic. A fun way to be able to do it, but then also while still not having... um, uh, an interval clock to be able to make it go or just do a group ride like Hannah said for me motor pacing like that yes. to me I mean motor pacing serves so many purposes but that is absolutely one of them and it's really funny because I can sense my attitude shifting as it gets hard too. like I'll get yeah. much more frustrated with the driver as I'm like starting to suffer i'm like you're fluctuating the pace too much and it's yeah. like nope you're <laughs> suffering and you have to keep suffering because you don't get to yell that in the middle of a race <laughs> yeah exactly imagine yelling that to the leaders they're like what's come on <laughs> yeah uh this all in your head thing and this is the last thing i'll bring up on this i think it's really important to recognize the reality of the effort and that it's really hard and then like hannah said earlier in terms of bwr utah and like not letting the emotion of the moment expand beyond what the reality of the moment 
you have to recognize that in the middle of those hard races, even though it's really hard, you can still do it. You'll get, it will hurt, but you can get through. And I think that that's a key thing. Like you said, your body relents at a certain point and you're like, okay, I understand that you're going to make me hurt a lot and I will quit yelling so much about it internally to you. Uh, and so you do have to, you do have to trust that your, what your body can do if you've done the training, if you haven't done the training, don't trust it because it's not there, right? You can't, but if you've done the training, then you do have to kind of ignore those signals sometimes in a race and just be like, all right, so it feels bad right now, but I know I can do this. And then just be like, who knows what it'll feel like later on. So I'm not even going to think about it. Um, cause sometimes you turn a corner even mid race like that. And sometimes it just stops feeling so hard. Last question from Victor says, what's up trainer road. I have a training question for you. Every week we have a group ride that starts in the, in the flats with vicious attacks and counter attacks for about seven minutes. It's nonstop and super intense. And while I'm not strong enough to be one of the guys attacking, I'm finally strong enough this year. And then Prince, says, thanks to trainer road. Awesome. Love to hear it. Thanks for signing up Victor to hold on to the tail end of the front group. The tricky part comes after this when a 10 minute climb starts, the attacking and countering cuts the field in half. But once we hit that climb, nearly everybody drops off except for the same five to seven guys. Now that I've made it to the bottom of the climb with this group, I badly want to hold with the front group front of the race. As I go up that climb, my FTP has gone up 18 months, 18 Watts since I started with trainer road. And I've finally cracked four Watts per kilogram. What do I do or need to do in order to not lose that front group? Then uh, goes on to mention, I have no other big race goals for cycling. I like to do big rides during the summer with friends, but more than anything, I just want to be at the pointy end of this weekly group ride. So like on the training side of things, uh, I'm thinking of specific workouts that we actually have that are, that are really good for this sort of effort. And what you can do is if whatever training plan that you're following here, um, in this case, Victor, you can swap this out with alternates. And if you're, or if you have a VO two day, but you want to swap this out, you totally can. Uh, it's, it's anaerobic attacks. It's a style of workout that we have. And I'll put one on screen so you can see right now. Um, this is kind of like a, a slightly easier one in terms of like the duration, but this format is key and I'll explain it to you, Hannah here, but basically you're going to have really hard, like 30 seconds on 30 seconds off and like anaerobic style efforts. You'll do somewhere around like five to 10 of those. And then after that, you'll settle right in to like a longer block, somewhere around eight minutes or so of mm -hmm. like low threshold or high sweet spot. And that sort of effort is really hard. And I swear it, that threshold work like interval will be a journey. Like <laughs> you will start out and you'll be like, I, there's no way I'm gasping for air. This is so hard. But then after you have to tell yourself, I'm not going to listen to my signals for the first three minutes of this interval. And then because after a while, what happens is your body, since you're just below lactate threshold, it starts to be able to cycle, process, and clear all of that. And then three to five minutes into it, you're like, I can do it. Then toward the end of it, again, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. But just the same, it's that kind of like, you know, that 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 journey that you go through where it feels really hard and then it comes out. But that's that anaerobic attacks is what we have them labeled as in the trainer row workout catalog. And you can swap that in for your workouts, uh, for what you have scheduled just because of the specificity of what you have. And that's something I'd suggest with everybody when you're following the training plan, you can use alternates and, or you can just swap them out on your calendar. And the cool thing is, is you can use, like when you look at the workouts, you can check how difficult you want the workout to be. If it's going to be achievable, productive, or if it's going to be a stretch or a breakthrough, and you can check those boxes to make sure that you're filtering and just looking at workouts that are going to be productive for you, or just looking at workouts that are going to be achievable or something like that. And if you're doing that, you'll be able to find an anaerobic workout that's appropriate for your abilities. That is just a different style of anaerobic workout. So that's like a really cool thing of being able to get the right workout and make sure it isn't just going to blow you up. The one thing I will mention though, is that sometimes interval formats can vary pretty widely in a specific zone. So if you are going to pick like and change things up from your plan, you might want to start with an, like a, an achievable workout and see how that feels with this new interval format and then go from there. But just the same, I think that that's like a really, sp I mean, honestly, it's kind of crazy because Victor, it sounds exactly like these workouts where it's like on off, on off, on off, and then boom, and then you go into it. But just the same, uh, I think that could really help you. But 
there's a lot of other soft skills around this too, right, Hannah? Like you can train for it, but you still have to be able to execute. Do you have any tips for like things they can do to be able to hang in after the punching happens or maybe during the punching, what they can do to be able to hang on during that climb? Yeah, I think aside from those training aspects like Jonathan just mentioned, it's really about sitting in as much as possible before the climb. If the climb is where you're getting dropped, that means I would save as much of my energy for that crux moment as possible. And so that means one sitting in, obviously using drafting as much as you can. Um, that kind of seems somewhat obvious, but if maybe you're not super acquainted with exactly where to be in the group or how to do that, that's an easy get. Um, but also I think a lot of people with these sort of attack style races, they don't realize that they're working so much harder than everyone else. So I would really play back one of these group rides in your head and think about where you are when these attacks are happening. So gosh, there's just so many ways this can play out. Like if you're already on the back of the group when the attack is happening, this can be an issue because now you're getting gapped and you're having to close that attack with all on your own. Um, maybe an attack is going and every single time you're the one to close that gap. And maybe it's because sometimes I know that this happens because maybe you are the weakest link in the group. And when someone attacks, you feel this sort of panic in your mind of like, oh, my gosh, I can't get dropped. I have to be on top of this. Um and so you feel like you have to close that gap immediately versus maybe if you have a little bit more confidence, you're more willing to sit there and say, OK, so who's going to close this? Um, and then you wait for someone else to go around you. I know that sometimes someone will attack. Everyone else will stand up and follow the attack and fill in the gaps. And I won't even have increased my power. I will just yeah. be riding along and everyone just fills in front of you. And that's. That, to me, is like the success. It's not being able to close that gap with your strength. It's being able to close it with as much cunning as possible um, to use as little of your energy. And so that's also where you can smooth out those attacks. Like, I think, again, people hear the shifting of someone about to stand up. And so everyone shifts and everyone stands. And yeah. then maybe the attack doesn't even go. but you've shifted and stood and you've shifted and stood and you've done all these like three to five second efforts to um, discourage someone else from attacking. But really, you just ended up doing the same amount of work that they're doing also. And so you're blunting yourself the same amount that they are blunting by attacking. And so all of this comes with race practice, um, with those, like Jonathan said, those soft skills. But if nothing else, start thinking about how can I make this as easy as possible? And I would make this a very fun challenge for you of in this group ride, start looking at your power to the bottom of that hill, not as, oh my gosh, how hard was it today? I held X amount of watts to the climb, but instead, how low can you make that number by the time you go to the climb? Like today, I only did this much and I was still in the group when I got to the climb. That will be your mark of success. Well, that's a really good challenge to have. I, uh, adding more to what you said about when everybody accelerates and then it goes single file. And if you were to measure the time from the first rider to the last rider, and whereas you were all in a group and you were effectively within the same second, when you're stretched out in a line, it might be 10 seconds. And it's crazy when you think about that, because if you were just to slowly accelerate and knock it out of the saddle, but you were already at the front of that group when they attack, that might let you drift to the back. And then here's what happens whenever there's an attack and a counterattack, it always eases up eventually. And when it eases up, what you do is you just stay at the same power instead of coasting. And then you just drift your way to the front again. So then you're ready for it to happen again and you won't have to worry about it. Now, clearly, if somebody's going to attack and actually get separation, you need to know who you're racing against because you don't want to miss those moves. But a lot of the time when it's just this sort of hammer fest that goes on, you don't have to get involved in that, like Hannah said. So that's a really good tip. The other thing that I think of with this, I, I watched E3 or uh, one of the, which has been an incredible season of racing so far. 
but E3 is a really cool race to watch to see what happens when you're definitely marked as the fastest rider and you have really fast riders that can follow you, but still nobody as strong as you. Now, very few of us are ever in this privileged position in our lives, right? But watching Matthew Vanderpool race that race, it was really interesting to see him absolutely doing what Hannah said, intentionally drawing people out and making them attack. And then he'd sit up and you could see that like he would sit up and sometimes it wasn't because he knew that he was being marked and he couldn't get away. It was way too early for him to go solo, but at the same time, he's so strong. I'm sure that they were worried about that. So there were a lot of riders that were still attacking and there were some riders that counterattacked over the top of him. And then what he would do is after they counterattacked over the top, he would wait for them to blow up. And then after that, he would just counterattack over the top again. And he kind of set up this like cadence of him going and then resting him going and resting. So then any, he would wait and see. And if somebody counterattacked him, he'd be like, that's the guy I'm going to get out of here next time. And then he would just counterattack them and make it go. So you really have to be careful to not fall into their traps. Like these really strong riders that know how to work this group ride. If you fall into their traps and their rhythm, it'll throw things off. And instead, what you want to do is not be on the front foot, being the one deciding the rhythm, but you want to be the one, like Hannah said, smoothing it all out so then you can show up there at the end. But it's a, it's a really interesting, like it's so much fun game theory. And I think that's why group rides in particular, like road and gravel racing in particular are so much fun is because you're able to like test out these different theories and everyone has this strategy and they're being coy with it and you get to see how it all works. It's just the funnest part of bike racing and riding for me. So Super cool stuff. Uh, Victor, hopefully that helps. Congrats on getting to four watts per kilo. Stoked that we could help you with that with Trainer Road. It's your hard work, though, that's for sure. Um, and hopefully that that helps. So those anaerobic attacks also like raise your thresholds, right, Hannah? Like if you have a higher FTP, whatever the attacks are, are going to be a lower percentage of your threshold. And then that just means that it's going to be less difficult for you. And that's and then obviously on the climb, it's going to help too. But exactly. Yeah, hopefully that helps. So Hannah, thanks for joining us. If you're going to be at Belgium Waffle Ride Utah, go say hi to Hannah. Um, cheer her on. Maybe like have uh, some warm gloves or something for her. I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and hopefully the weather holds for you. And if you're listening to this podcast and you appreciated it, you can share this podcast with other people and rate it on Spotify. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are very close to 100,000 YouTube subscribers, which is fantastic. But the more you rate it on Spotify and iTunes and everything else, more people will discover it. And then that helps more people sign up for Train Road, which means we'll be able to make more content and an awesome product for you. So sign up. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Bye.